Welcome back to Enabling, Preparing, Restoring the West. Um, our first speaker this afternoon is going to be Jack Conley. Jack is a principal wildlife research biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. He's the lead author of the Sagegrass Management Guidelines and the Conservation Assessment of Greater Sagegrass and Sagebrush Habitats. Jack has been involved in research and management of sagegrass and sagebrush habitats in the Intermountain West for over 33 years. Please welcome Jack Conley. Uh, thank you, Darren. Um, we're going to, there we go, we're going to wander a little bit for the next 25 minutes. I'm going to talk about fire, certainly, and sagebrush and sage grouse and my old friend Smokey the Bear. I think poor Smokey has gotten a bad rap lately. There's uh, been quite a bit of interest in restoring fire to different ecosystems throughout Western North America. And uh, with that, maybe his admonition to uh, uh, prevent wildfire has fallen on hard times. So uh, today we'll maybe examine Smokey's warning again and see if it might apply to sagebrush step. A couple of key points first. The sagebrush ecosystem is certainly one of the largest ecosystems in North America, but it's an ecosystem that's in serious trouble. Between invasive species, oil and gas development, urbanization, agriculture, and so forth and so on, uh, we have some real problems. Uh, in the Great Basin, 10 million acres right now are, are at moderate to severe risk of loss. Okay, within the uh, uh, interior Columbia Basin, about half the watersheds are showing moderate to strong uh, declines for sagebrush-dependent species. And, and we could go on and on and take up an hour, I suppose, with this, but I, I think you probably get, get the point. Now, how does fire fit into this whole business? This issue about fire and, and sagebrush has been around for some time. I was first introduced to it in the early 1980s when I went to a meeting and there was clearly two groups of people at that meeting and, and they weren't divided by discipline, it wasn't range people versus wildlife people or anything like that, but two groups with different views on things and, and uh, fire was the major topic at that meeting and, and certainly one group of uh, folks there argued that fire was a natural part of the sagebrush ecosystem and that sage grouse evolved with fire and that fire would have no real severe uh, consequences for sage grouse populations. The other group was equally convinced, I suppose, that fire was rare in most sagebrush systems, and that sage grouse did not evolve with fire, and to, to argue that they did was somewhat akin to arguing that maybe we evolved with fire, so if your house burns down, uh, it's no big deal. I mean, if you live where I do, uh, in southeastern Idaho, and your house burns down about now, unless you've got some good friends, you're going to die. You know, uh, Fire, they then argued, would have negative consequences for sage grouse. Sage grouse are going to die, is what they were, they were saying. Now, two very different views, but they did have something in common. At that point, there were virtually no empirical data upon which to base these, these arguments or these views. But times have changed since 1983, and now we know an awful lot about fire and sage grouse and sagebrush, and we can talk about that, and perhaps along the way answer a couple of pretty simple questions. First of all, with regard to sagebrush landscapes, is there too much or too little fire? With regard to fire, should it be suppressed or should it be restored? Now, before you get into this whole issue, you almost immediately run into two, two similar but somewhat different terms, and I'm going to use them a bit interchangeably now, but I recognize there are differences. Fire rotation and fire return interval. Basically, people trying to get at the idea, hey, how often in the natural scheme of things did a given piece of the sagebrush landscape burn? And there's lots of estimates out there. Scientists certainly understand that not all sagebrush is created equal and that we have fairly mesic sites and we have fairly dry sites. And, and, and just as a, as a few examples, we see for the mountain big sagebrush types, the, the more mesic sites, estimates uh, of less anywhere from less than 15 years to every 
35 or 40 years, uh, these folks were predicting that fires would occur <coughs> in the natural world without any interference from man. When you move down the hill and get into the more azuric sites dominated by Wyoming big sagebrush and low or now little sagebrush, I don't care much for taxonomists because they confuse me, but low is now little. Anyway, we see that those estimates go up, and now we're talking, at least in many cases, of estimates of around a century or more. Okay, so there, there seems to be a general agreement uh, that fire was more frequent at higher elevations, more mesic, more productive sites, and less frequent at lower elevations, but there does seem to be some disagreement, if you will, or at least discussion about you know, how, how often this actually did occur. And then Bill Baker from the University of Wyoming uh, came onto the scene a few years ago and he said, wait a second, you know, I've got some concerns about how these estimates were derived and so, without getting into the weeds on this, he developed some correction factors and then presented a, a fairly compelling paper that argued that these intervals were really much longer than what a lot of the literature indicated, but there still was that indication that fire was more frequent at higher elevations and less frequent at lower elevations, and basically your lower little sagebrush areas did not burn at all. So. The other thing we've seen then, uh, since the publication of that paper, is m more information coming out saying, hey, Baker's right. You know, Our information supports his information. So I, I just bring this to your attention. We don't have to get bogged down on you know, how often a particular area burned, but simply understand that there are a number of estimates out there at this point, but there tends to be a, a fair bit of thought given now to the idea that uh, fire was really pretty infrequent in a lot of sagebrush systems. So, if that's the case, then what's going on? Uh, the next series of slides basically span my tenure working on sagebrush, sage grouse, and fire in the Intermountain West. I started in the mid-70s, and, and I'm happy to say that Carl Womble started before me. <laughs> but I do remember if there was a fire, a range fire, at that time, we all went out to see it because it was very unusual. And given the distribution of fires, and take this first slide with a grain of salt because I'm not convinced that fire reporting rates were as good in the 70s as they are now. But regardless, it's probably fairly representative of what was going on. There's quite a bit of fire in Idaho. This is along the interstate corridor, and they were building part of it at that time. And this little group of dots here, well that's what happens when the Air Force drops bombs on sagebrush rangeland. It tends to burn, okay? That, that happens. But other than that, not much going on in Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, and so forth. Uh, by the 1980s, the picture had begun to change. And here we pick up the Yellowstone fires of 89, and some of these fires are forest fires, so you can forget about those and those. But these are all sagebrush range fires, and we're starting to see an increase in fire in uh, at least the Great Basin, but still not a lot going on over here on the eastern edge. And this, this uh, outline that you see, that's an area that we uh, studied or <clears throat> when we were working on the sagebrush conservation assessment a few years ago. So that was kind of the boundary of our study area. By the 1990s, the things have really changed. And you can see the terrific increase in fire here in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Nevada's burning up, and on and on. At this point, we can answer that question. Is there too much or too little fire? Okay, there's too much fire. Now we have to think about this other business about, well, are there places that fire still needs to be restored or not? But I don't think anybody at this point in time would argue that we don't have a problem with fire in our sagebrush systems. So we know we have this fire, we have to deal with it, but do we know what's going on in terms of its effects on the system? And, and yes, we do. Uh, because since 1983, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to understand fire effects. And so just, just and we're not gonna, again, beat you to death with data, but just let me give you a couple of examples of some of the information that we have. Uh, and I want to start with one of my favorite studies, and this is, Carl, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder here, but this is a particularly good paper. Uh, and, and 
he used a design that I was to use later on, but basically two areas. They went in, they measured sagebrush canopy cover uh, before a fire and, and, and an adjacent control area. And to no great surprise, they found 18 years later, hey, there's no improvement of fire. Okay, that, we know that now. But what's interesting is they also saw this drop in sagebrush canopy cover, all right, in the non-burned area. And I, I'm not familiar with Carl's study area at all, but I have seen the same thing in our study areas in Idaho. And I think the important point here is to understand that sagebrush stands are dynamic. A sagebrush stand doesn't develop, go to 22 or 25 percent canopy coverage and stop. You see this ebb and flow of canopy cover uh, due to insects and drought and so forth and so on. So it's a dynamic system, and I think we sometimes fail to recognize that. So when somebody says, hey, we got 27% canopy cover, we better go burn it. My usual response is, first of all, how did you measure it? Second of all, why don't we wait a couple of years and see if it changes? Okay, different study, this time in Idaho, an area I am familiar with. Fairly mesic site, grading from Wyoming big sagebrush up into mountain big sagebrush, uh, Pamela Nelly went ahead, and this was an area where there's a lot of prescribed burning, and so she measured canopy cover in these different age burns, and, and basically her, her conclusion was, hey, you know, 14 years down the road, even in this, this fairly basic site, we're not seeing much recovery in the way of sagebrush canopy cover. I'll come back to that in a minute, but the bottom line is it, it takes a while to recover. This is not something that happens overnight. Herbaceous cover. Now often I hear people say, well, we want to burn it so we can improve the grasses, we can improve the forbs. More recently, I'm hearing people say, we got to burn it so we can improve sage grouse habitat. I guess trying to get at the idea they're going to make more forbs. Well, I guess that can happen, but again, going back to Carl's study, we see, you know, there, there's a grand improvement here of, of 1% after some 18 years. And uh, people might argue that forbs have increased, but they did the same thing in the unburned area. Pamela made much the same point. She said, whether we're talking new fires, young fires, old fires, or unburned areas, there's virtually no change in the forb canopy cover. Okay. So, and again, we could go on and on. There's a number of other studies out there, but the point is, that yeah, sometimes there certainly is some information out there that suggests that fire and, uh, uh, will show an increase in grasses and forbs, but there's an awful lot out there that says you can't really predict what's going on and that this, this in fact isn't always a given. Now, sort of a last, this is from a paper we just published, uh, two points. First of all, with regards to sagebrush canopy cover, some 14 years after a burn, and this is a Wyoming sagebrush site, a very Zurich site, again, no recovery, okay? And we're not gonna see it recover for quite some time. The other is uh, major forbs. These are things that grouse eat. And in fact, we saw a decline over the period of time. Bugs. We kind of forget about bugs, but in fact, this is a pretty important component of the sagebrush ecosystem, especially if you're a sage grouse chip or any passerine bird, really. What happens? Well, again, a study by Rich Fisher indicated, and first Rich uh, showed a, a, a pretty strong relationship between sage grouse chick foraging sites and hymenoptera, or ants, and then following the fire, a real crash in the ant numbers. Now, the same sort of thing was going on in an adjacent control area, they ultimately decreased some, but what fire did was make a bad situation worse. Again, the Nelly study showed something a little bit different, a real influx or increase in insects in new fires, but then pretty much a wash after that. What happened here was the detritus feeding beetles, tenebrionids, and so forth came in, and they were gone after about a year. So, some important points, okay? First of all, fires are an increasing, increasingly significant disturbance in sagebrush ecosystems. If fire return intervals or fire rotations, however you want to characterize them, have changed significantly. They've shifted spatially, and Rick Miller offers some evidence to suggest that uh, he's seen some decreases in fire at high elevation mountain sagebrush communities. Where this is occurring then, uh, we get what, what Rick likes to call the big squeeze. Conifer encroachment from above, 
<clears throat> coming up against invasive species from below and literally squeezing the sagebrush dependent species. That brings us then to sage grouse, okay, the uh, ultimate, I suppose, sagebrush obligate species. And, and <clears throat> sage grouse are not your typical run of the mill game bird. They're not a pheasant or a quail or anything. These birds tend to be long lived, they have high annual survival rates, low reproductive rates. Okay? Every year, on average, no matter what study we pretty well look at, about 20% of the birds will not put forth a detectable nesting effort. That's a lot of grouse. They're very susceptible to disturbance. They, their clutch size tends to be low. Those that do nest actually do quite well. Renesting, that is, if they lose their first clutch, will they try again? In most cases, not very often. These are all characteristics of a species that's, that's, that's adapted to a very stable habitat. And in fact, I was talking to a paleoecologist about two weeks ago, and he told me that they had just discovered uh, uh, Brachylagus, uh, Idaho pygmy, or the pygmy rabbit, and sage grouse remains in strata that they estimated to be 35 to 40,000 years old on the upper snake. This would triple or quadruple the estimated persistence of, sage, of the sagebrush steppe in that area right now, if in fact that's true. The system's been around a long time. They are in fact habitat specialists. During the winter, the only thing sage grouse eat are the uh, <coughs> leaves and buds of sagebrush. They gain weight on that. During the spring, they must have sagebrush and a healthy, healthy herbaceous understory for successful reproduction. In the summer, they switch things around. They move into these four bridge areas. They still use sagebrush, though, for loafing and escape cover. So they're really tied to sagebrush. So what happens when their habitat burns? Again, just a little bit of data to kind of give you some idea of what's going on. There's a lot of information now available. Uh, during the late 90s and early 2000s, we were doing some long-term work on, on sage grouse and sage grouse vital rates in the upper snake. And uh, we noticed grouse were just kind of crank along. They're doing their usual thing in terms of nest success. One of our areas, the Table Butte area, burned in late summer of 2000. Immediately thereafter, the next year, nest success rates fell to 18%. It stayed up in the other study areas. 2002, it was also at 18%. Okay. Uh, a different study, again in Wyoming sagebrush habitats, we were measuring, trying to measure the effect of a prescribed burn, a 10,000 acre prescribed burn in breeding and winter habitat that took out 58% of the sagebrush overstory. Prior to the fire, and this is the same kind of design that Carl used, fire, prior to the fire we saw declining populations as a result of drought. After the fire, we almost wiped out the sage grouse population. Again, fire made a bad situation worse. Some people don't like percentages, they want to see numbers. This is from the same study. We went from an average of 67 males on Lex to 22 versus 59 to 36. So again, no matter how you look at it, bad news for sage grouse. While we were doing this, the Oregon folks were also interested in fire and Mike Byrne over there told us that females, his radio marked females, avoided burned habitats, that fire in low in Wyoming sagebrush provided no apparent value to sage grouse, and yet the area he was working in had a routine prescribed burning program going because they thought it was the ecologically correct thing to do. Now, things can also be a little bit subtle. I've talked about Wyoming sagebrush and the fact that we've got problems with fire invasive annuals uh, and so forth, but there's something else that's going on, at least in parts of Idaho and perhaps elsewhere. And that something else is called three-tip sagebrush, which sometimes increases after fire, okay? And this is a, uh, one of our studies where the BLM was coming in and seeding burned areas to Wyoming sagebrush. And when they did their windshield botany deal some 10 years later, they saw lots of sagebrush and said, gee whiz, we're doing a great job. But then I sent in my research crew and they came back and said, hey, about half of that is three-tip sagebrush. Well, what does that mean for a sagebrush obligate species like a sage grouse? It's not good news. Sage grouse prefer to nest in big sagebrush as opposed to three-tip. When grouse do nest in three-tip, their nest success rates are significantly lower than what's going on in big sagebrush. 
So again, it's fairly subtle, but who knows what other relationships there might be going on out there. So let me wrap up with a couple of points. First of all, when we talk about fire and sagebrush, we're oftentimes going to hear somebody talk about fuel reduction, decadence, lack of understory. Fuel reduction, unless we're actually dealing with urban interface, that, the, the argument here is often we've got to burn it to save it, and it has no merit. Decadence, as I said earlier, most of these stands, they're living, dynamic stands of sagebrush. They're going to have old plants. They're going to have young plants. They're going to have dying plants and dead plants. They're all in this photo. Uh, that doesn't mean they're decadent and need to be treated in any fashion at all, and yet that's often used as, a, as an excuse, if you will, for going in and, and treating these stands. And this business of lack of understory, that's true. We do have a lot of Wyoming stands especially that do lack of an herbaceous understory, or it's very impoverished. Okay? But as I've heard Steve Bunning say time and again, you can't get something from nothing. So if it's gone, burning is not going to bring it back. Can we prevent wildfire? Yeah, maybe, but we're still in, in our infancy here. Our, uh, we're much better off <clears throat> at this point in time, putting our efforts into suppression, keeping small fires small. Uh, I teach a fire shrubland ecology course every year in Seattle for firefighters. And every year, without fail, I have somebody show up and say, Gee whiz, I knew in such and such a fire, we should not have burned out that last piece of sagebrush. Yeah, you're right, you shouldn't. But firefighters tend to do that. I guess it's just part of what they do. You know, It's a bad deal. And we also have to watch out for some of the dogma that I mentioned earlier. So it's our choice. Going back to my old friend Smokey the Bear, he is a good guy. He did serve us well in, in, in telling us that we need to suppress or avoid wildfires, okay? Otherwise, we end up with these kinds of landscapes and they're gonna persist for quite some time. And if, if we're lucky, this moves into a cheatgrass type area. We could get Smokey and his boys on the job, end up with sage grouse reproduction and then maybe some grouse to, to admire for years to come. Thank you very much. Can I take questions now or questions? Well, uh, yeah, there, there are, and, and, and a lot is going to depend on um, how, did, uh, how did Dave Pike put it a couple of weeks ago? He said a lot of it is dependent upon basically luck, and, and he, he used the uh, analogy of a seven-card stud. And if you're really lucky and, you know, you get the right kind of precipitation and you're on, the, on reasonably good soils and so forth, and you know, maybe some good management, you might get restoration or the, the, the actual sagebrush back in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But the way things go out here, we have persistent droughts and all kinds of other issues going on. Uh, Bill Baker says about half of what the fire return interval would be would be your best, your best guess. So anywhere for... for for Wyoming sagebrush from 50 to 100 years. And that's certainly what we're seeing in our, our field work. Yes, sir. So I'm reflecting upon hearing your assessment of conditions post-fire with sage grouse and everything else. What is your opinion on the very popular sagebrush treatments, mechanical treatments, like Sahara, for example, that are happening all over Utah and elsewhere? Are they ever justified for any restoration? Okay, I think, um, I think you asked, what is my opinion on other kinds of sagebrush treatments, like mechanical treatments? Um, certainly you have more control than you do with fire. Now, one of the problems with fire is it burns where it wants to burn, and usually it burns where there's a good understory, and that's exactly the, the spot you don't want to burn. So if you're worried about, say, trying to improve herbaceous cover, um, you want to treat areas where that cover is lacking and then maybe you want to go in and, and reseed them. And, and mechanical disturbance allows you to do that. 
Uh, so I don't have a real problem with that technique. What I have a problem with sometimes is people just going in saying, gee whiz, we got to do a project here. And, and then they, they, they pick their favorite area and go out and mash it up for no real ecological reason. That's what I have a problem with. Yes, sir. We'll follow up on that question some. Oh, ma'am. Um, there is a fair amount of defense going on under the mechanical defense under the name of decadence or lack of understory. And it seems like, uh, what would you think in terms of the need to look at why there's an understory? I mean, the assumption always is the understory is not there because the safe rush are getting too dense rather than that maybe it's I, I, I can't quite understand everything you just asked me. So let me wander up there a little bit. <laughs> so I can hear what you're saying. I can talk about it. Okay, let's try that. Yeah, I can't even see it. You're so far back. <laughs> there you go. All right. The, there's a fair amount of treatments that are going on, the mechanical treatment, the the rubric of decadence, or lack of understory. And the assumption is the lack of understory is there because the same brush have gotten convinced and decades ago, but the same thing. Anything over 15% cover is convinced. It seems to me that there isn't enough question as to why there is an understory there. And will then the mechanical treatment solve the problem? Is it be Sure. Um. The issue is, will treatments, mechanical or otherwise, solve the problem if it's not an understory, correct? Right. And, 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 and the lack of looking as to why the right. understory right. is something I would, I would never just, just, just go in and recommend a treatment simply because it looks like it ought to be treated. I think, first of all, you have to do some pretty careful measurements to find out what you're actually working on. Then you have to start asking questions about <coughs> what that habitat might also be important. As an example, if you've got an area that really is, uh, I'm not going to use the word decadent, but that's an ecological background term, but if you have an area where there is virtually no understory, and that could be because of something that happened 100 years ago, right? You may want to restore the understory. That's not a bad goal at all. How do you do it? What happens if it's sage grouse winter range? Can you go in and burn it? Well, if you do, you're going to wipe out your sage grouse population. <coughs> Can you go in and annually treat it or apply some type of value on it and then put it in seat? Yeah, you could probably do that. But again, that's going to take some very little <coughs> thought and planning. So I don't want to say you don't ever want to, you know, do a treatment. But these things have to be very carefully thought out. And, uh, How do you separate the lack of understory from the overgrazing and from the lack of understory because of the state I mean, all you got to know is that. Story and the other story is complete. You may not know, uh, you know, that you may be dealing with, with uh, problems that occurred, like I said, 100 years ago, and you want to fix them now. You don't really know what occurred 100 years ago. So it's a pretty tough deal. 